said that uh, it's twin day, I said, oh, that's why they invited me. I've got a twin sister out in California. And uh, good thing she doesn't look like me. So some people said, does she look just like you? No, no, she's about three times as tall as I am. Well, I'm thankful for the privilege. I find an honor to be here. I have one main instruction they gave me besides the hour I'm supposed to end, and that is not to embarrass my daughter. And so uh, my daughter is a student here, and I can't mention her name. I give her initials, and uh, I see some acquaintance over her, but she's hiding, so that's okay. And uh, like I said, we've been on the field 30 years, and of course we did things in a different fashion back then. I went to PC and graduated back in 80. So my message is going to be on the scroll here. This. <laughs> All right, it's a, anyway, it's a privilege to be with you here. And uh, I am uh, going to be a little nervous when my professor is back there, so I don't know what kind of grade I'll get from this, but uh, it's, it is an honor to be here. Uh, I haven't been much in Springfield. This, this major city that you guys live in, it's just awesome. You know, they got Walmart here. You know. <laughs> You've got donuts or something like that. So anyway, I'm going to do a passage out of Proverbs this morning. And... Uh, before I get started, you know, life is a collection of choices that we make. My wife always says, uh, distance and direction produces your destiny. And so uh, we went to the field 32 years ago, uh, just barely speaking Spanish. And I remember we moved up out after two years of language study. Alguien habla español aquí? Okay, this section over here speaks Spanish, so I'm going to do Spanish on this side. And the rest you'll have to just kind of follow along. Anyway, we, to, we went to the mission field 32 years ago. And I remember after two years of language study in the city of Santiago, we went, moved up to a city called La Serena. It was about seven hours farther to the north. And I remember that uh, we just had a little boy at that time. And so we were going to actually go out for a meal. We had never done this uh, down in Chile. We were going to go out for a meal right after uh, the service on Sunday morning. And so we went down to the center. There was uh, one of these uh, escalators. You know what an escalator is? We had one. It didn't move. <laughs> so the idea was that the, sta the steps were at different stages going up. And we got up there not realizing there was about four or five or about eight actually restaurants all around this, this patio area. And I remember as we got up, uh, my wife and I were looking to see where, we hadn't decided where we're going yet. And two people dressed in white, they were not angels, but two people dressed in white, they were coming up and, and they were kind of worked as the, uh, as the what do you call them, mozos? the uh, waiters, and uh, they started speaking very, very quickly. All I can remember is that, and I couldn't understand what was going on, but I thought, yeah, okay. So I started following them to their restaurant. They were actually trying to put in a, a word for the restaurant. So I started following them to their restaurant, and the problem was then it got to a certain uh, hallway, and then one went to the left and one went to the right. So we weren't sure what to do. So we decided to go straight. As we st continued straight, they came on behind us, and there was two more that were meeting us. Before long, we had, we were, it, it was quadraphonic. You know, we had two in the front, two in the back. Each one was telling us what was the specialty of their day. And all, again, all I was bunch of people, all these things were coming out. I couldn't understand anything. So we didn't know what to do. So we kind of decided we were almost going to walk out because it was just getting too confusing. So one of them gently took my arm to the right, while another one gently took my arm to the left. But that was okay until they started, one took the left leg, the other took the right, and they began pulling us in four different directions. And uh, so I ate in four different places that afternoon. Now, the reason why I bring that up is how many times do we feel like we're being pulled in four different directions or more? School, work, church, family, uh, romance. Anybody ever feel that way? We're going to have a little participation here. Anybody ever feel like they're just being pulled in so many different directions? And we're trying to decide, Lord, what do you want me to do? And we want to make some, some good choices, but many times we end up making some dumb choices. Does anybody belong to the Dumb Choices Club here? Why did I do that? You know, some people do it so much they hit themselves and say, Stupid. And pretty soon they start losing their hair right about right here. <laughs> I, was, I was watching, I had to get the message by the way. I was watching uh, one of these things about dumb crooks. This one guy, they were going to steal an ATM. Do they have that ATMs in Springfield? 
he was going to, this is down in Florida, he was going to steal an ATM machine. So what he did is he backed his car up and put a chain around the ATM to his back bumper. Anybody see that? Remember that one? And they pull out the ATM, but what it did is pull off his back bumper. And so he left his back bumper with the license plate, <laughs> the registration. It didn't take long, they caught him. Hey, there's another one. He went into the store, and as he was in the store, uh, he was going to rob this, this convenience store. And just as he, he had the girl by the gun, he says, get all the money out of the cash register. Then finally he decides, I'm going to take the six pack of beer with me. Well, the girl's thinking pretty smartly that she goes, well, I can't let you have it unless you show me your ID. So the crook takes out his wallet, shows his ID. Look, I'm over 18 years old. Okay, yeah, go ahead and take that. Of course, it wasn't too long and he was in jail also, you see. Crime doesn't pay. Well, I've done some stupid things in my life too. We, we, live, we live in an earthquake area. We live in a country where we get quite a few earthquakes. We had a, a little one about two years ago, 8.8 .8 on the Richter scale. And uh, in, in these earthquakes, uh, we get tsunamis. And so I live on the 18th floor of our apartment building across from the ocean. We're suffering for Jesus. And uh, 18th floor. The tsunami only goes, the warning only goes up to the 12th floor, so we're in good shape. And I remember before we first moved in this new building, uh, the elevators weren't working real well. So I remember I had to go up to the 18th floor, the elevator stopped working, and I had to carry a, a photocopier up. And I remember going up the stairs. That's not too bad, I mean, that's the only way to get up there. The problem was, I remember getting kind of daydreaming as I was going up. Next thing I know, I'm looking up and 22, 23, I live on the 18th floor. So I'm thinking, Pfft. should I tell one of my daughter? I can't mention her name, but I'm gonna talk about my youngest daughter. And uh, for some reason, she peeled an orange and decided that she wanted to see what it was like to put it in a microwave. I don't know if she remembers that or not. <laughs> but she ended up with blisters on her tongue. That's how hot the, the orange had gone. So anyway, okay, one more question. How, how many of you have ever done something stupid? Okay, now, I want to I do a passage out of Proverbs because the Proverbs, most of them written by Solomon, uh, are Proverbs act about talking about wisdom. And I like to give simple meanings as I'm speaking on things. And so I'm going to just give my very simple uh, definition of wisdom, okay? Wisdom means to make right choices, okay? Wisdom is the ability to make right choices. How many would like wisdom? We know God is the source of all wisdom, and we know that God gave Solomon a, a, a divine source of wisdom as he wrote many of these. So I'm going to use this passage of scripture. And I've been told, as a missionary, I could find a mission message out of any passage in the entire Bible. You give me a passage and I'll make it a mission. So in Proverbs chapter 30, and in verse 24, I'm sure you hear this about every other week in chapel. So if you've heard this passage before, I know it's a missionary message. And, uh, and let me just say this one too. I'm going to read out of King James. Um, and the reason I say that because I, this morning I checked into the other versions of what it was. And there's some differences. And so I'll bring that out too. But here's, here's it in King James. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 24. And I'm sure you've heard it before. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with their hands and is in king's palaces. Uh, have you heard that message in the last month? If so, I'm going to change my message right now. Have you heard that one? Have you, have you ever heard that passage? It almost sounds like it's a publicity for an extermination company. You give us a call, we'll get rid of your ants and your locusts and your spiders and your lizards. Now, I noticed that in, in the one where it says conies, uh, in others it says rock badgers, or what was that other one I saw? Um, What's another one it says? Okay, that's for, the, that's for the last one for spider cells. So it says lizards. But let's just go from there. Actually, the reason why I want to bring this is because God's word is God's word from the top, from the beginning to the end. I believe this is divine inspired scripture. And I believe there's four principles here that apply to every young person, an old person that's here today. 
And so if we can get past a little bit past the idea of little animals and such and start thinking of what kind of principles, do I have the ability to make right choices? And I know the younger you are, the more important the choices are. And so the first one I want to go to is verse 25, the ant. The ant is a feeble folk, but they make, but they, it says to 24, it says they, they, uh, the ants are people not strong, verse 25, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The first principle is provision. They're not living for the moment, they're thinking to the long term. Now we live in the now generation. We live in the credit card generation. Enjoy now, pay later. Anybody know somebody like that? Uh, I, know guy, I knew a guy in, in Chile, I went up to the Lord, Jorge McGuire, and uh, he got a loan from the government to start a business. But what he did was, he noticed everybody that was successful drove nice cars, had nice offices, had a big staff, uh, and so what he did was with the loan money that he got, instead of investing it in his, his uh, company, in, 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 he invested it in having a nice office, a nice staff, a nice car, a nice place to live. He, he bought the vision of success, but he didn't even do anything towards the company. Now that's okay for about the first year until you have to start paying back the loan. And he didn't have any money to pay back the loan. And the reason why, because he was only living for the moment. You see, we need to realize that this life is, very, is passing very quickly. I'm already 39 years old and a little more. <laughs> and you see, this life's going by fast. There's a promise. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. And this promise says this. Samuel's talking and he's telling King Saul, says, you've blown it. And so he says, or, or to Eli, he says, your children have blown it. You're not going to be able to continue. And so, because God will honor them that honor him. Anybody hear that verse? I will honor them, God speaking. I will honor those people that honor me. Now, the word honor literally means to give importance to. God is saying this, if you will give importance to me, I will make you important to me. Now, God's promises, there's two types of promises that God does. One of the types of promise that God does is a unconditional promise or unconditional promise where he says, I'm going to do this no matter what. For instance, let me give this one I shared at the church on Sunday. Um, God said to Abraham, I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And so there's a promise. If you curse Israel, God's going to curse you. Now, I don't know if anybody ever heard of Hugo Chavez. Hugo Chavez used to be the president of Venezuela. And Hugo Chavez, in one of his discourses, said this. Yo odio a Israel, lo odio y yo lo maldigo. Maldigo desde mis entrañas, lo maldigo. That's pretty strong words, isn't it? I mean, when someone said that, I'm going to start stepping a few steps away from them. Actually, what he was saying, he says, I curse Israel from my intestines. And right after that, he developed intestinal cancer and died two years later. How often does God keep his promises? About 95%? How many say God keeps his promises 99%? <laughs> How many of you say God keeps his promises 100%? Raise your hand. I believe God keeps his promises 100%. And he said, if you will honor me, if you'll make me important, I will make you important. I need two volunteers. So I'm going to go with, um, let's see, Michael and uh, Will. Two volunteers. <laughs> I learned that when I was in the Air Force. Now, how many have been to a cemetery? You see they got these, uh, these uh, tombstones. And there's two dates on the tombstone, right? There's the first date is the date of? The second date is the date of? And they're separated by a dash or a dot, okay? And so we got, okay, uh, Will, why don't you stay over here? Birth and death, okay? Now. <laughs> now, think of that dot that separates your date of birth and your date of death. That dot, that enclosed little dot represents your entire life. It represents your birth, it represents your grade school, it represents your high school, it represents your, your college, it represents your future career, it represents your love, it represents your marriage one day, it represents your kids, it represents your, your grandkids, it represents your career, your, your retirement. I'm thinking in Spanish, excuse me, so I'm trying to pull in some English words here. And then, and then it goes all the way to tell you to hide. All of that! And one little dot. Now, Michael? Now this is very high tech, I can tell. What do you think? Okay, I want you to believe that dot represents your entire life on this earth. 
And God says, if, if you will honor me, if you will make me important to you, I will make you important to me. And these are two geometrical figures. One's called a point, and the other's called a ray. Okay, Will, would you come on over here? And I want you to demonstrate what a ray is. A ray is a line that has a beginning but no. Can you open that up? God says, if you will honor me here, I will honor you here. Now just keep going. There's a door over there if you need it. Okay, well, that, that'll show it. Do you get the idea? The ant is not thinking of now. The ant is thinking that winter is coming. There will not be the food out there. We've got to get the food now so that we are prepared for the future. Is the ant wise? Now, how, how wise are we? Are we living for what is going to happen this week? Or in a sense, we're, what's going on after we get out of college? What's going to happen? What's going to happen when I get to be in my 30s, in my 40s, in my 50s? Where will you be 50 years from today? Where will you be 100 years from today? It depends on what you're doing now. Thank you. Just put it on the ground. It's electronic. It'll roll up all by itself. Give a hand to these two volunteers. <laughs> the teachers will give them a higher grade. <laughs> Have you ever seen a, a hearse going by with a U-Haul trailer on, hooked onto it? You see, we get, we, got caught, we get caught up so much in the material things that are just going to be going on. Uh, I remember uh, going down with my wife. We live along a beach. Our, our beach is 3,000 miles long. Chile's a country 3,000 miles long. It's only 110 miles wide. A lot of beach. My wife and I, we went down to this beach. And as we're on this beach, and we're walking along, uh, strolling along romantically. And, and so we're, we're strolling along, and, and, and we're walking, and there's not very many people there. It's kind of wintertime. I look off at the distance, and, and over in the distance, I see a couple walking. And this couple walking, you can tell they're in love. You, can, you know, the, the butterflies are flying around them, you know. And, and they walk along, and they kind of go up a certain area. They kind of stoop down, and you see them doing something in the sand, and then they get up, and they walk off. So my wife and I, we're walking along, and as we look over there, uh, we're not, we're not nosy. But we're curious. So we kind of stroll over there, and sure enough, we look down there, and if you look down in the sand, and sure enough, there's this big heart in the sand, and in the heart it says, Juan y Maria. And my wife says, Okay, so now, now it's about another week later, we're walking along and off the distance, sure enough, we see another couple right off the distance, the same place, and we're walking along, strolling along, and look over there, and says, Oh, look at them. And so we start walking closer. Now we're not, we're not nosy. But we were curious, and so we, we kind of decided we wanted to get closer, and we looked down there, and sure enough, there's this big heart in the sand. And sure enough, there's two names in the sand. Juan y Deborah. <laughs> That's what you call a Don Juan, you know? And so that went on a couple of weeks until finally we heard the story about what, how this one ended. And so Juan, now Juan is walking along and he falls in love with a girl. Her name's Catalina. And he says, hey, let's go down the beach. Let's put our names in the sand in a heart. He says, she says, no way. They've just put a new street in. It's all fresh cement. We're going over there. We're going to put our names over there. And she wasn't a dummy, right? Watch out, girls. Now, okay. So my question is, is we see the ant providing for the future. And I asked myself, is, am I writing my love for Jesus Christ in the sand or in the cement? Think about it. Think about everything that we're doing. How much of that is going to be for eternity and how much is just for today? Now, we're running out of time, so I'm going to go to the second one. Verse 26 talks about the coney or the rock badger or the hyrax. Now, I'll just use what it says in my Spanish Bible. Does anybody know what a coney is? Anybody got a pet coney? Anybody got a pet rock badger? In my Spanish Bible, it's used the word conejo. Anybody know what a conejo is? I know you guys over here know. They're from Argentina. What's a conejo? A rabbit. Have you ever seen a rabbit, that ferocious creature, the fangs come out of its mouth like this, it's got claws, it'll take your neck off. Is that the way they are? No, see, the, the little rabbit knows that there's a coyote out there that would just love to invite him for dinner. And so what this, what this little coney or conejo or, or hyrax or rock badger or whatever name you want to put in there, what he did was he realized that he needed to 
a adequate source of protection. The first one about the ant was provision, providing for eternity. The second one is protection. And he went and he made his house, one, one version says the cliffs, my version in Spanish and here in English says, he made his house in the rocks. Now, what animal does the Bible use to describe us? What, is it, what does it use? Have you seen a powerful sheep? Have you seen a smart sheep? Have you ever noticed that that's not very good for our ego to know that the, the, the kind of animal God uses to describe as a sheep, you know? You know, if you go out to the pasture, I don't know, do they have pastures in, in Missouri? Okay. You go out to the pasture and there's a horse out there. Can that horse find its way home? Can the cow find its way home? Can the dog find its way home? Can the cat find its way home? Can the mouse find its way home? Can the cricket find its way home? Can the sheep find its way home? You know, these sheep are out there, and it's starting to get dark. Maybe some forgot about them. So I think they just put their paws in their, they don't have paws, but they have hoof. <laughs> we'll use sheep for now. So they put their, she their, 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 their sheep feet <laughs> into their pockets and start whistling. Have you ever seen that? Someone's got to come by and pick us up. And then one of them decides, and these, these are not you guys, these are other adolescents, you know. And, and, and one of the sheep says, hey, let's try something. I'm going to chip off that cliff. And the other says, hey, that's an idea. And then they, okay, so God says that we are sheep. And God says, and, and I'm not going to talk about the intelligent part, but I'm going to talk about the, the, the thing that sheep do not have an adequate source of protection without the pastor. So what it says that these conies made their homes in the rocks. And now you know the parallel here when you go to Matthew chapter 7. It says the wise men, or the foolish man built his house upon the sand and the storms come and takes out the foundation. But the wise man built his house upon the rock. Now, Jesus explained it, so there's no, no problem in understanding what he's trying to say. He that hears what I have to say and doesn't do it. It's not even talking about the ones we never heard. It's talking about those who have. He that hears what I say and doesn't do it, he's foolish. And his foundation is not very strong. But he that hears my word and obeys my word, he's a wise man. And so he's telling us that the, the principle of protection is living in the center of God's will for your life. Now, I have a problem with that for this reason. My oldest son had heard that. And I had a plan for him to go to Bible college. You know, dads have plans for their kids. And he calls me and says, Dad, I just joined the army. And, and in fact, he was going to be a Green Beret. He became a Green Beret. He was over in Afghanistan. I says, what? It's all my fatherly compassion. What? Are you a sheep? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> Don't you know we're at war right now? I was in the Air Force, but it was peacetime. And I was going to use every single excuse I could to talk him out of going into the Army until he said this. Dad, you taught me the safest place on this planet is in the center of God's will for your life. And that's where God wants me to be. And I said, yes, but. No. <laughs> How would he argue with that? Now, we know the story of Jonah. Anybody, we know the story of Jonah, right? And we know that God says, I want you to go to Nineveh, to the country of Assyria. I want you to go down there and proclaim my word to them. And he thought that was dangerous. And he decided to take vacation and go in the opposite direction. And he thought that his way was safer than God's way. And he found out the hard way, didn't he? First submarine ride in history. And as he was inside the belly of the well, Anybody ever been to a fish market? We have one in Chile. Anybody been to a fish market? How would they smell? Now that's the outside of the fish. He was on the inside. Swimming around those gastric juices. And think about it, when he finally was vomited, as the word says, vomited up on the land, he said, God gave him a second chance to do what he had called the first time. Can you imagine these people, they're doing their jobs there, and, and, and then of it all of a sudden, what is that smell? 
And then they look over here, and here's this man, and probably his hair has started falling off in clumps because the gastric acid that's in the stomach has been burning it. His skin is bleached white, his clothes is all tattered. And he's, walk, he's a walking uh, object lesson. You better listen what God has to say. He means business. And so living in the center of God's will for your life is the safest place. Now, that's not to say something bad won't happen. It's kind of like having insurance. If you get insurance, does that mean you won't have an accident or that you're prepared? And see, if you live in God's will, that doesn't mean that bad things aren't going to happen. That means that God's part of the problem. He's part of the solution. He's, part, he's there. Now... Do you realize our mission fields, and I don't know about Kenya and Nairobi and other parts of the world, but I know in Chile we have supermarkets. You're supposed to say now, oh, we have supermarkets. Okay, now, I went to get a, my wife sent me to get to the, to the supermarket, and I'm going to, to the supermarket, and I get the cart, but my cart has the bad wheel. Do they have carts with bad wheels in Springfield, Missouri? I mean, I'm trying to go around and negotiate all the, the terms here and everything, and, and I want to go straight, and this cart's just doing this. And it's pulling off to this side over here. And so, I, by the time I get done, my, my arms are tired. I've knocked over the apples, and it's just been a mess. Okay? Has that happened to anybody? I wonder if God's arms get tired with us. I wonder if, not you, I'm talking about the young people outside. You know, I wonder if God says, I've got a plan for your life, and you say, that's great, God, but I have a better plan. We got that bad wheel. And he wants us to go this way, and, he, and we're, being pulled, we're pulling him off the aisle. Is that possible that, not you, but somebody out there is that way? Does God have a plan for your life? I absolutely believe that God has a purpose for every person here, without exception. And I believe that God is going to show that when the time comes. I, how many want to know exactly right now where you're going to be in 20 years? Okay, it's not going to happen. See, God's will, I say, is like a long corridor. Now, this long corridor has a number of little curtains along the way. And so I say, God, just open up all the, all the curtains. I want to see right on. But you know what? I was that kid, as a kid growing up, there's two things I never wanted to do. Public speaking, because I am extremely shy, and I get scared just getting in front of people. And the other one was leave the country. I like LA. We got Disney now. And yet... God had a purpose to be obedient to him and do what he wanted us to do. So the first one was, and there's supposed to be, oh, I said, the first one was provision. The second one was protection. The third one, verse 27, the locust. They, in some versions, they, they march, and it says they go they forth by bands. And as I look at that, go forth, I'm thinking of purpose. They have a purpose. They go forth. Have no king, or you could say they have an invisible king. They are going forth in bands. On the first three, the ant, the coney, and the locust all talk about community. All of them are together. They go forth in bands. What has the Bible called us to do? Go into all the world. I told you that my wife will send me to the supermarket. I remember she said, I want to get in the, I live on the 18th floor, get in the elevator, go down to 18 floors, uh, I get in my car, I drive to the supermarket, go inside, because she just got done saying, honey, we need bread. We've got, we got gas coming over. You go buy some bread. And I remember going inside now into, into the supermarket. You know, there's always something on sale when you first get in there. So I got a little basket this time, and I don't have to get much. So I put something in the basket, and then I walk along and say, oh, look at that. I'll get that for my daughter. And I put that in there. And I walk it over here, and I get something else, and I look at my time. Oh, look at the time. I'm already late. So I get in my car, drive home, go up to 18 floors, go inside the apartment. What's the first thing my wife says? Where's the bread? I go in the elevator, go down 18 floors, get in my car, drive back to the supermarket. I, I lost sight of the prime I had a senior moment. Lost sight of the prime objective. You know something? Think about heaven one day. How many think that? Uh, how many like to sing? Do you know, are we going to be interrupted when we go to heaven? Or are we going to sing there too? We can sing in heaven. How many like to learn the scriptures? Learn about Abraham, David. You know what? Will we learn about God in heaven too? How many like fellowship? How many like eating? Well, let me ask this question. What is the purpose of a locust? Anybody know? The purpose of a locust is not eating. 
The purpose of a locus is to reproduce. It needs to, to reproduce. What should the purpose of a Christian be? What should the purpose of a church be? Consumption or reproduction? My, my theme verse is 2 Timothy chapter 2 and 2 where Paul says, that, that which you've heard among faithful men, commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. I believe the greatest thing we can do as purpose is influence people all around this world for Jesus Christ. And I'm already out of time, so I'm just going to skip the last point here. What's the first, pr what's the first principle of wisdom here? Provision, thinking of the future. What's the second principle? Protection, living in the center of God's will for your life. What's the third principle? Purpose. And God's purpose for us is that we are with this. I want you to think of the word imagination. Imagination, and split that into two words. We were to take the image of God, that we were, we were created in God's image. It was distorted by the sin of Adam, and, and, but we are still, you know, in a nebulous way, we are still in God's image. We are to take God's image around the world to the nations. Imagination, taking God's image to the nations. Use your imagination, what God could use, what God could do if you gave your life completely in his hands. The last one is the prize, whether it's a lizard or a spider. It's in the king's palace. It doesn't deserve to be there. It's there by grace. And I think of, when I talk about, let me just share this real quickly. I, I, I live in a country that is very, very religious. How many would say that Springfield is very, very religious? Now, are religious people saved? Is there a difference between religion and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Can I give you an illustration of what I use down there? How many know what a peephole is? Now, married men understand that. That's the, when they're looking to see if their mother in law's coming. Now, let's say that let's say that you go up to somebody's door. I go up to somebody's door. I'm knocking on the door, and some lady comes up. She's looking out that peephole. It looks like her her hair has been in a, the explosion in a mattress factory, and she's she's looking out that, and she's got a little chain on the door still. She says. Oh, pastor, it's not a good moment. My kids are in bed. Uh, my husband's not home. The house is really disordered. Could you come back another day? And, of course, my answer would be, no problem. And I leave. Now, did she recognize who I was? Did she talk to me? Did I get inside her home? See, that's religion. Religion is believing in God and even speaking to him. How many know people that I believe in God? I pray to him every day. But a personal relationship, you have to take that little chain off and open the door and say, just as I am, would you please come in? That's salvation. That's when Jesus Christ comes to take his abode uh, inside of us, when there's a transformation, a true transformation taking place. But i gotta, I got to end with one last thing, and I know I'm sorry I went a little late. But provision, protection, purpose, last one is prize. This one is by grace. Uh, can I, I'll share two things. That, that means you have a shorter class after. It's about salvation. See, I have to find different ways to help people see what salvation is. In Chile, they know that it's not how much you give to the, but it's who you know. You know it's that way too. Let's say you're in a physics class. My oldest son is now studying physics. And let's say you're in that test, and in that test, the, uh, the teacher says it's, it's a hard test. I'm gonna let you use a, a one piece of paper, and on that every type of of a formula that you can think of. You can put anything on that for that test. Everything that's on it, it might, might be like taking Greek and you put all the different uh, uh, th things on there it, that uh, you can use to take your test. So the test time comes and everybody's coming in and everybody has, you know how they write real, real small. I mean, they've got everything you can imagine on that piece of paper. And so everybody comes in with their papers all full, and, but one, one kid, and he doesn't study very much, and you can tell he's kind of a goof off in the class, but this guy comes in. And he brings this piece of paper in blank. Now this has something on it, but imagine. It's a blank piece of paper. Everybody says, oh boy, are you going to fail this test? Well, he comes in, he takes that blank piece of paper, and he places it on the floor. Then he invites the professor of physics from the nearby college to come in and stand on that piece of paper. And so now every time there's a question, he says, now what's the answer, number one? Okay. Number two? He ate the test. Not only that, that, the professor gave him extra credit for having been very uh, wise in what he had done. You see, salvation is not what we do, or, but it's who we know. I could tell you about four or five more, but we're out of time here. So I want to go into this last one. The prize is being saved, but the prize, as Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, is 
forgetting that which is behind and present for the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. But you know, the problem I see today is a lot, there are a lot of kids that graduated from me at PC back in 1980. And I'm wondering where they are today. There's a lot of them that are out. They're not doing anything. Just making a living. Just going home every day. And I remember as I was in eighth grade, and then like I will say, you know, missionaries in about four times. This is my fourth time, so I will end. And when I was in eighth grade, my, the anatomy of my body was this little head and two long legs like that. <laughs> and I ran track, but I wasn't very fast. And so they put me in the long races, like the 660, where you were running half times around the track. And so on this occasion, my, uh, uh, there was an invitation. Me, two runners from every school. School had come to run. Everybody, everybody, every school said somebody really, really fast, and then somebody like me. And so it was a special day because that day my dad came to watch me run. He was up in the, in the stands up there. And I purposed as I said, Dad, I'm going to win this one for you. So here's this, this group. This, you've seen ESPN, haven't you? You know what this is like. You see that mass of muscles out there. And bam! The gun went off. Let's wake up the first thing. Okay, the gun went off, you know, and, and as the gun went off, you see this mass of muscles running around the track like this. And as time goes on, you know, they start spreading a little bit, their mass of muscles go around, and they got two more guys back in. Now, I wasn't last. There's one more guy behind me. And after a while, the reality hit me. I said, I'm not going to win this thing. But I said, I'm not coming in last. I mean, if that guy behind me starts to pass me, I'm going to trip him. <laughs> well, as I'm going around that last curve, I think, I'm making some progress here. I don't even hear his footsteps. And I look behind me, and he's gone. This guy decided, I'm not coming in last. And so as the track curved this way, he just ran off into the sunset. <laughs> that sorry rascal, he let me run by myself. And I remember as I got past the last, the finish line, I finished, you know, about two hours later, but, you know, I, I, I passed the finish line. I was so embarrassed that I ran faster to find the farthest place to hide. Can you, can you visualize this? And I, laid, I found this place. I laid on my back. I felt sick to my stomach. I remember uh, feeling sorry for myself, singing that song, Nobody Loves Me, Everybody Hates Me, I'm Going to Eat Worms. You know I, mean? <laughs> I now know that one in Spanish. Now... <laughs> I didn't think I'd get any worse until I look up and there's my dad standing over here and found me. I said, oh, dad, I said, I am so sorry. We'll probably have to move now. <laughs> Maybe change our name. <laughs> and he stopped me. And he said, son, be quiet. He said, I was, I was up there, I saw the whole thing. And when I saw that other boy quit, I got so scared. I said, oh, son, don't quit. Finish the race. Don't leave. He said, when I saw you finish the finish line, he said, I was the proudest dad up there. You gave it your all and you finished. See, I thought my dad wanted me to win. He just wanted me to give it my all and never quit. You know, sometimes we get our eyes on other people. We need to get our eyes on the Lord. Our Heavenly Father said, it's going to get tough. You think Bible calls is tough. Let me prepare it on. <laughs> It'll get tough. A lot of people quit when it gets tough. Don't quit. Wisdom is staying with it. Four little animals. Provision. Protection purpose, 